Hey everybody, it's uh, Kevin Wadsworth and Patrick Karim again, NorthStarBadCharts.com. And uh, back by popular request, I have to say, we had such uh, incredible feedback last time. We had uh, Michael Oliver on our show and uh, had a whole load of questions and uh, it just went uh, completely out of the park when we had uh, when we had Michael Oliver on last time. So uh, it's with great pleasure that we welcome Michael back. Michael, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you guys? We're great. Good. Patrick, how are you doing? <laughs> Hi, Mike. Hey, Patrick. So, uh, so today what we're uh, talking about, I think, is the US dollar and uh, some pretty key um, key moves that the US dollar is perhaps in the process of making and uh, also uh, silver and gold. I think we're talking about Michael today as well in particular. So I know a lot of people have been really frustrated by the action uh, in, in the precious metals markets recently. Cryptos seem to be taking all the headlines and uh, also uranium more recently as well. So uh, What's happening with uh, with the US dollar, gold and silver? Starting with the US dollar, what, what's uh, what's your analysis on this? Well, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of conversation in the last few months about gee, the dollar is strong, but you have to get a microscope out to see any strength because uh, we've been in the <laughs> dullest price range for the dollar over the last 13 months that probably in its history, in terms of the up down, it's been in a three and a half percent or so range, uh, almost asleep. And of course, that's reflected by the euro because euro is 57% of the dollar index. OK, so there's really no strength in the dollar. It's just it's not breaking down at the present. Uh, I, I've given you some charts here that are that are very, very telling. If you, the top chart's a price chart and it just shows the monthly closes of the dollar going back 40 years, uh, the black line. And you can see we were up 160 in the dollar index. It collapsed down to 80, went up to 120, collapsed down to it's near 70, then went back over 100 again. This is in 2015 and 16. And there's an arrow there. And what that arrow is, that down arrow, is when the momentum chart below it broke an uptrend line that goes all the way back to 2004 on the momentum chart. Now, there wasn't a trend line on the price chart that you could define in the same way that you had a one, two, three, four, five point uptrend line on the momentum chart, in the black line. And in May of 2017, as the dollar oozed down back up under 100 and got to 99, we put out a report that said we're bearish on dollar long term. Okay. And what happened after that is the dollar dropped to about 88 area in April of 2018. And then it spent the next couple of years basically above that level, running back up toward 100 again. And then it dropped last summer. Yeah, remember, it had a real sharp rally in the dollar March uh, during the March 2020 crisis where there was a rush to own dollars. And uh, OK, anyway, that was very, very brief panic and it collapsed. The dollar collapsed back down quickly, went back under 90 again on the dollar index. This just shows monthly closes and in, in intramonth action. It got down in the 89 area. OK. Uh, so in other words, we're bearish at 99 and right now it's traded 91, 95. OK, of course, we were bearish a couple of years ago, but we, it's a long term assessment. We're not dealing with week to week, month to month swings. But this since July of last year, the dollar has been stuck in a range from about 93 and a half down to about 89. And right now we're smack in the middle of that quiet little range. But look what's happened to the momentum chart below. So when we had that collapse in 2018, when we broke the black line, the black uptrend that did. 11 year, 12 year uptrend line. You collapse down and you stopped on the red line. Now the red line connects momentum lows. So what's momentum readings here? What these are is we measure each month's close in its relationship to the three year moving average. Changes once a year, we change that metric here. And you'll notice there's a low in 1987, 88, down there at 40 points under. Then there's a set of lows in 2004, down around 25, 30 under, and you fired up off that line. Each of those two times, you just exploded off that, that support line, that red line. And you also exploded off of it back in April of 2018 when you hit it the third time. You shot up pretty nicely, impressed a lot of people. Didn't turn it back into a bull, as far as we were concerned, but it was a nice rally. And then last summer, <clears throat> we came down and hit that line, that red line again. And we've been hugging that line for 13 months. 
Now, the tonal difference between this hit on the line and the three prior is obvious. When they kissed that line before they exploded off of it, in other words, the support was not just support, it actually turned it up, okay? This time it's not turning it up. It's like the, the dollar is sort of broken and it's groping on this structure. Now, if you look at the price chart, you don't see the structure, but on momentum, I see a four point trend line now that goes back 33 years. That's a structure. It jumps off the page at you. So it's our view that the downtrend that started in 2017 is about to embark on a new leg down. And this one should be more obvious than the first one in terms of violence, noise, and disruption caused by the foreign exchange markets. And the major forex markets have not been, they've been so quiet for the last 13 months. I'm talking yen, BP, uh, and, and the euro, which is again, the majority weighted currency in the dollar index, uh, to where there's been no action at all. It's so quiet. And you know, like they say, always beware of the quiet one, the guy in the corner, okay? Uh, so this is a potential factor, a wave effect creator that could impact other markets. It has not impacted him for at least the last year or so. Why? Because it's been so quiet. So it's something to watch. And in particular for the gold folks and silver. Think about this. If you go back to 2015 through 17, when dollar was up at 100. But basically, since that period of time, the last six years, the price of the dollar has been stuck in about a 10% range between 100 and 90, let's say. Okay. That's a pretty narrow range. And so right now you're, you're sort of in the lower part of it but it's really not been dropping sharply. But what's gold done during that time? Since it's 2015 low, it doubled in price. So gold had a major upsurge, which we think it's still in process of adding to, without any real help from the dollar. But now we think the dollar is really gonna be a help to gold and to silver and to commodities in general. As this four point uptrend line going back 33 years caves, Let's give you some numbers. We we're traded into the high 91s today on the dollar index. You get down under 91.50, we think it's going to start to come apart. You ever touch 91 again? I think it's really going to start to come apart. Now, the price chart crowd who are only looking at the top chart, they're going to get antsy if you break down much under 90, like get to 89 or something, because you'll be back at that 2018 low. You'll be taking out the recent lows. That's where they're going to get nervous. But we suggest you, uh, if you want to be short the dollar or have some position that reflects a weak dollar, like long certain commodities, for example, that you go ahead and anticipate that event likely happening soon, probably. Anyway, so this situation looks very pregnant for something big. Every time I look at that chart, Michael, I don't, it's like I know it has nothing to do with technical analysis. But I always feel that the U.S. dollar should have crashed in here in like 2017, and this is like just an artificial reprieve. I know it, has, it makes no no sense, but every time I, I look at that chart and I said, "Man, it's just unnatural." There, what, there's this three-year or four-year hiatus it, it did there, just moving sideways. But well, look sorry. at look at that low in 2018. After see the arrow, that's 17. You dropped into early 18. Okay, but look where that low occurred. Actually, intra-month, it got down into the, like 88 and a half or something there, okay? Look to your left now on the price chart. You'll see two peaks, those two peaks right there. They were just below the 90 level. In fact, intra-month during both of those peaks, they got up to like 89 area. So the price chart crowd bought the dollar in 2018 in that break on top of those two highs, thinking, oh, support. Mm -hmm. Well, it worked. It worked for a secondary rally. But now you're back pressing that again. So if you ever break that price chart crowd line that we haven't plotted, but you can draw a horizontal going back around the 89 price level, going back all the way to 2009. So go back a dozen years. Uh, you ever break below 89, the, that price chart watchers are going get, to get the message at that point. But momentum says no, nah, nah, the message is already being rendered. And if you drop even a point or so, you're going to break that red line big time, in which case momentum will be ahead of what price is about to tell you. Well, I'll tell you, tell you something that strikes me as well, Michael, is that, um, I mean, the dollar has a, a roughly three year cycle, low to low, 2015, 2018, 2021. Um, the next one being due 2024. So if this uh, period from uh, January of this year to now is the upward part of the three year dollar cycle, and it turns down here, 
Um, it's a very weak uh, three year sort of cycle for the US dollar. That means we've got sort of over two two years worth of um, sort of trending down into the 2024 low, which uh, which bodes not very well for the US dollar at all. It makes me wonder just how low this might end up going. Well, I suspect it'll take out the lows above 70 that occurred back a dozen years ago. Uh, yeah. But this is a third wave of a monstrous decline. So anybody talking about, you know, the reserve currency status, look at this chart and tell me it's good anyway. <laughs> I mean, you know, really, you know, we're at 90. We used to be 160, then we're at 120, and now we're at 90 groveling. Just just, just ask, pa ask Patrick about the uh, US dollar chart in adjusted for inflation as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Once, yeah. You, adjust, once right. you adjust this for inflation, then you're really talking about uh, yeah. a currency that's, you know, <laughs> worth nothing. <laughs> it's a um, it's a controlled demolition job. The U.S. dollar it's a it's a controlled demolition job. It's like I would do the same thing if I had the control of the currency. Every time it go up, of course I would devalue it to, to buy myself some toys and whatever I want. Some like, and of course, as soon as it's showing any strength, it's going to get devalued. Well, look, I don't want to go down narratives. The the let's like let the price action unfold. But uh, yeah, this is a one mega bearish uh, downtrend there for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not something new, the, the, the loss and the prestige and the global ranking of the dollar. Look at the chart. I mean, you know, this is, this is a huge bear trend. And we're just talking about another leg, a third leg down. And gosh knows where it'll go. Uh, I'm sure it'll probably take out that, that second low and just above 70. But, you know, it really doesn't much matter. I mean, you're talking about one piece of fiat currency being measured against another one that's not backed by anything either. So it's kind of hard to compare one piece of this versus another piece. I don't, I don't want to use the dirty word online, but, you know, it, comparing unbacked currencies is, you know, it's kind of hard to figure out which is worth less. <laughs> you know, it's a competitive issue of the central banks to, to degrade their money, meaning inflate their money supply. Uh, they're in competition right now. Uh, and I, you know, I suspect the Fed's going to beat the ECB <laughs> on the race to the downside. Well, I guess that's where gold enters, right? Because now that's something real you can measure these fiat currencies against. Yes, right. And it, I suspect within a year or two, because uh, I don't think this will be a slow crisis. I think this will be more chaos theory type trend, uh, not only down dollar, but up gold and, and other things moving in other directions. Well, uh, that there will be talk. I'm going to bet by late next year among intellectuals, academicians, and maybe some politicians even who are going to be saying things like, you know, hey, you know, this what we've done for the last 50 years, you know, unbacked fiat currencies. Uh, it hasn't worked. Maybe we need to figure out something else to do, you know, like have it backed by something. Uh, <laughs> well, <or> whatever. <laughs> what, a, what a radical idea. <laughs> so. It's going to be interesting for them. Okay. Let's go ahead to the uh, the silver chart, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. What we got here is a weekly price chart of silver going back to March of 2020. It was about 12 bucks then. And between March of 2020 and August of 2020, it like almost tripled. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, 12 bucks to almost 30. Okay. So that was an explosive chaos theory type move. In fact, a lot of it occurred starting just in June uh, of 2020 when it broke up to about 19 bucks. We had a signal at that point where annual momentum broke out and it went, you know, it doubled. It went up 50 percent in price in, in a matter of weeks. So three, you can see three big upward jolt weeks there. OK, that's a 50 percent move in three weeks. You don't see that very often. OK, and naturally, silver was very overbought at that point. You know, by any any reasonable standard, it, it, it gained so much so quickly. It was like, you know, transformed itself. And so like the chart on the bottom, what it does is it measures the weekly closes in relation to the that moving average that's plotted on the price chart, which is a three quarter moving average, it's sort of like a 200 day in its duration uh, in terms of how many, you know, what's its duration. And it changes at the end of every quarter. We adjust where the new three quarter average is. And it's been rising, as you can see. So while silver's gone sideways, basically in a range, and it's, it's sort of in the middle of the range right now, really, if you look at it, uh, just about 25 bucks at 2470 something today. Uh, it's been confusing to the price folks. 
you know, been up, down, up, down, you know, what's it doing? And, well, it's congesting. It's congesting way above where it was, you know, back in 20, early 2020. But for momentum, it got extremely overbought. It got like almost 70% above the uh, three-quarter average or 70% above the zero line. It was very high. And so it's been in a corrective phase, staircasing down, makes a low, has a rally, breaks that low, has another rally, breaks that low, et cetera, et cetera. But all during that time, while momentum's been cooling off, going from excessive high readings to, let's say, it's been around the zero line since uh, – Oh, February of this year, it's been above it and slightly below it. It's almost back to the zero line again, meaning almost back up to the three-quarter average. Uh, it developed what? It developed a structure, what we call a momentum structure, a beautiful three-point downtrend line defined by three peak weekly oscillator closing readings. And where do we close this week? Right on that line, right on the downtrend. Uh, the zero line... It's applicable all this quarter is where the new three, the current three quarter average is, and that's twenty five dollars and ninety eight cents. Okay, so we're about a buck below it or so with this week's close, or four percent below on this this oscillator. But we're on the downtrend line, so if you go any higher, like next week, you'll break the downtrend. But we sort of think the zero line is somewhat pivotal. You'll notice it made a low there back in in March, April, and rallied off of it. And then when it broke below that low, it was another staircase down. It tried to get back above it right after breaking it uh, back right there. Yeah, tried to get it, couldn't do it. You get back above that zero line anytime this quarter, meaning let's say close a week at 26 bucks, okay? Uh, you're going to close not only well above the downtrend, but you're going to close above that last pivot low. So at that point, we think that's a full breakout of this now year plus long downtrend structure. And momentum, momentum has gone down. In, in other words, it's corrected from overbought to neutral. In other words, it's cool now. It's not overdone. Uh, and it's aged. This is for this oscillator to trend for over a year. It's pretty old for it. We're talking four now going on to our fifth quarter of oscillator decline. And for this oscillator, that, that's particularly, you know, you go four or five quarters on the quarterly momentum, and that's generally it does, it's done what it's going to do. Okay. And what did it do? Well, all it did is cause price to go into a trading range. They couldn't bust silver back below the first low that it made back in September of last year. It was just below 22 bucks. That's like six weeks off the high. You could never go back during all the sell off since then and take out that low. They tried four weeks ago, I got to 22, 25. And now we're back up pushing at 25 bucks. So, Momentum gave price its opportunity to, to go down, and it wouldn't, meaning this is what we call a benign correction. Momentum cooled off, price went sideways. And so, uh, you know, gold didn't do this. Gold actually went down in price. It took out various lows, but silver went sideways. So right now, we'd say silver is on the cusp of flipping back up on its momentum. When you look at the price chart, you say, okay, where do I get long again? Let's say you got out. Or, or weren't long at all. Where do you buy it? Well, heck, you look at it and you say, well, I got to get back over 30, I guess, you know, right? You know, it's, it's been up to 30 a couple of times. So I guess to break out of this, you get a good over 30. Momentum says, no, don't wait for that. Around 26 bucks now, I'll do it on a weekly close. So this is a situation where momentum has done its job. It's cooled off. It's created a new structure to generate an uptrend. And it, it's going to signal it way before price ever gets the message which is why we like momentum. But what's beautiful, Michael, is I, I like always trying to see where I have like a fuel, like energy reservoirs. And here as the momentum is just back at, a, at, the, at the zero line. The last time we were here, or the, the, before the rally, the price action was at yeah. 17. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. so we have this much fuel. So if ever we extend this much, we go like chaos, we go chaos crazy yeah. up here. That means we could get another 50% run, but not well, from 17. We'll but go to the old dual highs on price at 50 bucks. Yeah. You know, 19, uh, what was that, uh, 74 high and the, and the 2011 high. You know, it was a 1980 high and silver anyway. But they had two peaks at 50 bucks. Uh, and, you know, I we suspect that what's going to happen when you come out of this range on price led by a, a momentum breakout. 
that your next move is to go up and test the bleeding obvious dual highs at $50. And we don't think that it will withstand the, the next assault. We think you'll break through that. At that point, the price chart crowd goes into, uh, you know, total zombie mode. They don't know what to do. I mean, it, there's no resistance. Look at a price chart. You're above 50. There's nothing but clear sky. Uh, our suspicion is based on some silver gold relationships over the last 40 years, we've run oscillators showing you know, what's price of silver in relation to gold. So you could easily see silver up at $200 an ounce. Um, and we think gold at that during the next year or two, could, if silver is going to make such a move, which we think it will, uh, could easily be up at uh, $8,000, $9,000 an ounce. Now, where do we come up with such a silly number? It sounds like a lot, and it's really not. If you go back and look at all the gold bull trends in history, there's four prior bull markets. Starting seven, early 70s to 1975, when it got legalized, it went from 30 bucks to 200, okay? In the spot market, and then in the futures, it opened to 200 in uh, January 1975. And then there were three other bull markets, each of which measured from its bear market low that preceded it to the peak was a seven and a half to eight fold move. Each of them, okay? Well, we started at 1,050 back in 2015 was the bear market low, 1,054 in late 2015. Well, eight times that's what, $8,000. So if you went to 8,000, you're doing nothing more than replicating the percentage gain that produced, gold produced in the fire, four prior bull markets. It's not exceptional, it's almost normal. Did it four times, we could do it one more time. Uh, probably go even further. Yeah, there you see the, the 2015 low there, and we haven't doubled. We've well, I mean, we've only doubled. We haven't gone up eightfold. Whereas the other bull markets all were eightfold moves. So anyway, that's uh, our expectation. So, now, what's well, it going to take? Well, well, I was just going to say what's going through my mind here. With it, I've just been looking at the silver charts whilst you're talking about that, and twenty six dollars does have significance on the. Um, on the price charts as as well, there is a quite an important um, rising trend line at twenty six dollars. But um, my uh, my own work on the cryptocurrency market leads me to think that in either September or October um, we're going to reach the uh, the sort of peak of this current cryptocurrency bull market. Certainly ahead of December and uh, most likely in the next sort of four to eight weeks. Now, uh, quite a large quite a large element of the you know people that are investing in cryptocurrency you know they they're either young uh, or they are uh, wanting to keep their uh, money away from uh, central government control and all all that kind of stuff and I'm just wondering you know I, I don't really tend to think too much about narratives as you know I'm a technical chart analyst and I you know primarily just follow what the charts are, are telling me in all their in all their different guises but it does just make me wonder if there's going to be a a rotation out of the cryptocurrency market and when people are looking on reddit for the latest um, right where do we put our money now that's got nothing to do with um government control and all that kind of stuff that that gold and silver um might suddenly become quite appealing particularly because you know precisely because of everything that you've just outlined there it's gone it's been going nowhere for the last for the last year you know we pulled back from 50 dollars to to where we are now you know we're sort of 50 percent lower than where we were so if you're looking for somewhere that's that's got value um, you won't be looking at the stock market. You won't be looking at general equities, mm -hmm. um, silver and uh, and and gold. You know, I can I can imagine having a lot of appeal. I I think so. And the uh, Reddit folks, uh, I, I did an interview with them, Wall Street uh, Silver Crowd, and uh, they uh, their Bitcoin perception is almost revolutionary. If you think about it for a minute, you got a young population that didn't get a lecture on, you know, the negatives of government and so forth, uh, they learn through Bitcoin that, hey, you know, we don't need a government monopoly over money. That's a heck of a concept to come up with. When you come up with a concept like that in a major arena, you know, money, you know, it's always been their parents and parents before them always accustomed. It has to be issued by the state. If it's not a status currency, it's not real money, right? Okay. All of a sudden you got a generation saying, heck, we don't need that. Well, if you make that intellectual leap, you could make a lot of others. But and uh, they've also made the leap towards silver. You know, that's a it's sort of their secondary Bitcoin. Uh, and I think they're fully justified fundamentally and technically on that issue. And I think 
we've made the statement that we think silver could be the next Bitcoin in its behavior, in its tonal behavior of what Bitcoin did, you know, a year ago, uh, up to the spring's highs, uh, that kind of ratio move. Uh, now, we're I think, I think my, my view would be that, you know, the, the direction of silver was kind of predetermined anyway. But what's gone on with Bitcoin and what's going on with the Reddit community and and uh, and all that kind of stuff at the moment is probably going to serve to amplify what would have happened anyway. So it's a kind of amplification process that could well just make things that little bit crazier. I, I quite agree. And I mean, and you, even if they're small purchases of bullion and coins by this person, that person, and so forth, it can amount to a huge amount of purchase taken collectively, sort of like a bunker hunt coming into the market, if you know what I mean. Mm. Uh, and I think silver <laughs> is going to beat gold. Uh, percent wise quite a bit and so it is the place it makes you wonder what the what the uh, what the miners might do as well because the miners and, tend i to think the miners will beat the gold and silver as well and the, right now you can't you make that statement and people laugh at you because the miners behave like uh, pathetic little dogs when gold when gold pulls back they you know they get all weak and shaky and then when gold upticks they suddenly get more robust than gold and that's been their behavior for quite a few years now uh, and we think that that's a very undervalued real world asset is to own the miners uh, yeah. they're not being properly priced certainly not as overly priced as the general stock market uh, no, well there, there, are, there are a lot of miners out there at the moment from a technical analysis point of view that are kind of i don't know if you're hanging on a thread is the is the right phrase to use but they're at a, certainly at a de decision point here many of them um, we're starting to ident identify charts that are well, they're either going to break down in a, in a pretty big way or we're looking at a, a, a pretty rapid ascent uh, in the next sort of 12 to 18 months. So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting to see if um, if this plays out that way. But, um, yeah, some some well, interesting I, thing, uh, technical charts coming up. Yeah, I think if you're looking at the miners technicals, which we do, uh, especially the grouping them, the GDX, for example, XAU index, the GDXJ, <laughs> Silver, SIL, uh, we think we argue that you need to take their technicals and put them in your back pocket or treat them as secondary. If that silver chart we just looked at breaks through that momentum structure, and two, if this gold chart breaks through its structure, and I'll explain it in a second, those two events occur and they're both nearby, okay? Technically nearby. If both of those events occur, I don't care what the minor charts look like, the miners are going to flip up. Mm. They, they're like little dogs on a leash, they'll be yanked back in a positive direction whether they're coming out of a hole that looks like they broke something or not. But gold here, again, here what we're measuring is gold weekly, top chart with the three quarter moving average overlaid. And uh, as you can see, gold corrected downside much more than silver did over the last year. Uh, it didn't build a sideways range. Instead, it went down, came back, retested the low in that panic sell off uh, that occurred you know, a month ago. Look like an engineered situation to me. I'm not a conspiracy theorist on market stuff, but that selling that occurred in the dark that night, that was crazy. Uh, that was not a sober person or an entity selling out their long position because they were doing it in a suicidal way. You know, they were collapsing the market. So if they wanted to get a good fill, they didn't get one and they guaranteed they wouldn't get one. So in our mind, that was somebody who didn't care that the price was collapsing while they were executing sell orders, okay, which tells you something. But look at the momentum chart and you'll see a structure. What it is, is there's the March low in 2020 when gold dropped from about 1700 down to the mid 1400s. There's a low weekly close there. We got a little arrow pointing at it. Just draw a line across sideways and you'll notice in November when gold had its drop at a Totally different price level. It was in the high 1700s up there. It wasn't back to the March low. But in the oscillator, it was to the exact same level, that weekly close. You could draw a line connecting those two low weekly closes. Then it rallied, rallied into uh, January or late December, early January this year. Then it collapsed down in January and broke that two point structure. So it broke a floor. And then in late January, it rallied back up, tried to get back above that line, couldn't do it, bumped its head sold it off. Okay. That structure then has been validated a third time. It's now got three points that define it. Then you had your sell off to the March low. And it was our view after that March low, when it turned up and went up into May, that that was the low for the bear market in gold. 
Well, they sure gave it a test during that night session. Again, in a matter of several hours, four weeks ago, when they sold it off, they got within a few dollars price-wise of that momentum low. Momentum didn't get back to the low. But prior to doing that, in May, during that rally, they closed a third time on that line. So you've got three weekly closes along that red horizontal line on the momentum chart. And you got the bump in January, bumped it from the underside. So you have four pivotal levels that all crested, either bottomed out or crested right at that line. So we now have a structure that goes back to March of 2020 on this oscillator that you do not see on the price chart. You do not have a flat overhead ceiling structure like this. What does it take to close out a week above that red line? Well, next quarter it's gonna change because the three quarter moving average is gonna drop. So the number will adjust down. But for this quarter, if you close out any week at 1865.50, to put a fine number on it, 1865.50, and we got in the mid 1830s today. So 30 bucks above where day's high is. And close a week there, you're gonna break out over that massive structure. Now, we bet, that if gold registers that momentum breakout, and if you look at the price chart, getting to 1865, which is slightly higher than where we are this week, isn't taking out anything important. The last rally high was above 1900, right? Okay, so when you look at the price chart, you say, well, 1865 doesn't mean too much, but on momentum, it means everything. So if we get that momentum breakout on this gold oscillator, at the same time, or really uh, nearly coincident with the silver breakout, over its structures, which we defined a while ago. That's a double thumbs up, okay? That's saying, okay, we're through with our congestion or correction process since last year's highs. We're re-engaging on the upside. Now the price guys are gonna to wanna to see gold back over 2000 or something or the high 1900s before they wake up and say, okay, it's gold's back, back alive again. But momentum says no, 1865.50 weekly close there this quarter. Any, any week, this, the rest of this month is a breakout. Now, when you get into next month, it's a new quarter, probably around today's highs, a weekly close in the mid-1830s during next quarter will break out over that structure because the three-quarter average will adjust down a little bit. But anyway, so it's also pregnant, just like silver, for an upside breakout. It's, and it uh, wouldn't shock us that if these two guys break out, that that dollar index we were looking at, you'll yeah. be seeing the dollar down at 91 or 90 at the same time, singing the same song, but the other way. Uh, and probably you'll be starting to see some weakness in the stock market itself. It's, uh, I understand now, like it's crystallizing more and more why this is a leading indicator, the momentum. It's giving you a $40 or I don't know how many percentage head start with against the rest of the field to position yourself. Yeah, that's usually momentum will do two things during transitions. It will warn you ahead of time because it has a pending structure that you can see. Uh, and now we've got a pending overhead breakout structure, starting gate. Okay, It's massive. It's clear. In fact, you don't even have to be a technician to be able to plot that red line. Hardly. I mean, you can you almost look at that chart and plot it without any technical expertise whatsoever. It's so obvious. Uh, and it, Usually when momentum sets up a structure like that, it does it with intent. Whereas it doesn't build a clear structure that jumps off the page at you just to ignore it and wave goodbye to it. It sets it up to set up the factors that will determine the trend change. In this case, turning it back up, putting gold's quarterly momentum back in line with its ongoing annual momentum, which is still positive. Never went negative. It's just a pullback on annual momentum. But uh, the quarterly, when it flips back up and when silver flips back up, I'd expect some noise out of the gold miners back to the upside. And a rush uh, by not just gold bugs buying them, but general asset managers have been paying attention to that. Uh, you know, Ray Dalio even said several months ago that, you know, you know, don't watch the price of your stock. Worry about the underlying value of your money. So he's sort of, in effect, become a gold bug. Uh, and I think he and others have admitted that they've, moved into that category it's not common for them man i'm getting That's shivers funny. every time you, you talk man michael i said jesus holy moses crazy well, stuff it's, uh, it, it's fascinating stuff because it goes to show that you know if you know where to look and you look under the hood of these things you can find 
clues and pieces of the puzzle that kind of put you a little bit ahead of, as you say, the price moves. Mm -hmm. the, the straightforward price chart shows breakout levels, support levels, resistance levels, and they're all good and you know a, a part of the story because the support level is there and it gives support and same mm -hmm. with re resistance levels. But when you can peer at indicators like this, that um, particularly this momentum indicator that kind of you know, it's, it's it's building up ahead of steam that is going to be required in order for gold to make that move. And once once that momentum indicator breaks out, then it's giving a much higher likelihood and probability that you can have the confidence that gold, silver, whatever it is that you're looking at, is going to go on and continue to to, to sustain that move even before it makes the technical chart breakout. Um, and that's a, that's an important, really important takeaway from this is that by by looking at that you know momentum indicator, it's um, it's, it's really putting you in the front seat. Well, momentum pre-validates the price signal. So in other words, the, when yeah. the price breaks out or there's something clear, like there's two highs over the last year, just above 1900, where you had weekly closes above 19. So when you get above that, the price folks are going to wake up, say, hey, it's breaking out. But it's pre-validated by momentum. Now, you can reverse that, too, where momentum protects you from false price breakouts. Quite often, you'll see a price set, set up and you think, oh, price just had a triple top breakout or so, over some dual highs. Well, you look at momentum and momentum say, uh-uh. Oh, it happened to the dollar three weeks ago. Uh, back in March, the dollar index had made a high above 93, but it couldn't reach 93.50. Failed about 93.40 something. It dropped back down. Then last month, it reached a high of 93.73. So it, it burst through the March high. And even if you were keeping a point and figure chart, like say a half point by three block reversal, so when you hit 93.50, it was a point and figure upside breakout, right? Okay. Price broke out. If you looked at all the momentum charts, they said, uh-uh, I'm not breaking out over anything. And so what happened? They bagged price. Price lied. Momentum warns you that price was giving you a false breakout. So either momentum leads price and pre-validates it, or it warns that what you think you see on price is probably not valid if momentum yeah. doesn't agree. There's um there's a couple there's a couple of questions I, if you if you've got a, a couple of minutes uh, to to answer these questions well, that's, the, the last time you came on and did a you know a fantastic interview for us it created a lot of uh, obviously a lot of interest a lot of views and uh, a lot of a lot of questions on uh, on our various social media feeds and there was one from um, Firefox on Twitter he said does um do, do you still ex or, or do you expect uh, gold to meet the Dow? So um, the, the price of gold to meet to meet the price of the Dow, because his, his own his own personal plan is to roll from silver to gold at a, at a ratio of 30 and then exit mm -hmm. when gold meets the Dow. So this is the, the mythical uh, one to one. I, I, suppose. Don't, I don't. Yeah, that's highly likely, I would say. Yes. Right. OK. <laughs> uh, the gold will meet now. Uh, but I, it's not something I measure. It's not a, a not a tool. No. It's, it's it's a it's a neat thought. Uh, but I mean, you've got a. a any equity asset manager who's been around and remembers what he's learned over the years, a lot of them forget, you know, they don't learn lessons sometimes. Uh, but we've been going up for a dozen years. You know, you look at an S&P chart, even the March break last year almost looks like a blip. So I mean, just a dozen years, look at NASDAQ 100. Never in history, over 100 years history of the US stock market, can you find that kind of trend? Well, I mean, you look at an M2 chart and you can figure out why it's happened or look at a, a Fed, uh, the interest rate chart. You know, it's like zero to a quarter percent for what, a dozen years? No wonder the market's gone vertical. They've made the money worthless, so it should go vertical. Uh, and, and I think commodities are finally joining in. You know, the price of bread probably be 20 bucks here pretty soon. You know, so <laughs> reflecting not a shortage of wheat, but a uh, a degradation in the money unit. And that's all the stock market's been reflecting. And asset managers over time finally learn, you know, like we can name them, but who aren't gold bugs, who've learned finally, you know, hey, this thing's overpriced by multiple metrics. So I've got to begin to phase out of this beast and move it into another asset category. And that would be the prime one would be the metals, to some extent, commodities, commodity-related stocks, which you've oh, not. Oh well, can I just can I just pause? Can I just pause you there, if you don't mind, because that oh, leads yeah. me to leads me to a question from uh, Brennan T. Lewis, and his question was, 
with gold and, si gold and silver, uh, possibly chaos theory moves. In your estimation, what does the rest of the decade look like and which sectors or commodities should we be looking at for the second half of the 2020s? So that's kind of leading into what you're just saying there, I think. Well, uh, among commodities, we analyze them all, basically. Uh, we turn basically bullish on all commodities, uh, with some few exceptions. We analyze the Bloomberg Commodity Index as a collective, okay? And yeah. some commodities aren't even in it, like lumber's not part of the Bloomberg, okay? And it went vertical for different reasons, we think, not, not so much inflation. Uh, personal safety notions is probably the reason that it went crazy, uh, wanting to build a house in a safe area. But most commodities went up in unison starting September, October last year, and they all just went wet bars of soap. They were grabbed and they shot up out of their holes. Uh, soybean. <laughs> I like that analogy. It's great. <laughs> and no, there was a grabby situation of an undervalued asset category that had been laying in the weeds for five years. I mean, you look at the Bloomberg, it just it was dead. Look at soybeans. They just dropped in 2016 and went sideways for five years. They just weren't going any lower. It wasn't an issue. Could they go lower? The issue was when are they going to turn up? And we got our signal last fall. And basically it was like, you know, soybeans were $9.30 and within months they'd gone up 50% more and cotton and sugar and you, you name it. Uh, so, but within that category, there are some we like better. Like right now we like natural gas more than any of them. Not more than gold and silver, but we think natural gas has broken out and it's, it's now in the mid $4 range, which in recent years has been fairly high. But if you look back 20 years or so, you'll notice that's, that's still a depressed price. We think it's going to $9 probably in this surge. Now that's to say a double from our buy point. Uh, actually, we, we got long at just above $2 back uh, coming off the lows of 2020. But now it just crossed some other big annual momentum structures that say to us, hey, this guy's not just going up, he's going up probably like a wet bar of soap. And when we do our technical measurements of momentum and we look at the price charts as well, they both say there's no reason for him not to go to nine dollars. And when you look at the price chart, that is not, that's not even a ridiculous price level. So on a percentage basis right now, we'd emphasize uh, we always like the gold and silver, silver the best, but natural gas among, among commodities on a percent basis and probably on a speed basis as well. We think that move could occur within several quarters. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's certainly answered the question. And, um, you know, that, you know, in my own analysis, looking at the uh, the commodity sector, there's a there's a whole range of, um, you know, uh, we're looking at battery metals or whether you're looking at uranium or, you know, you can you can quite easily see the demand for these things and where the demand is coming from. And you can look at the price and you can see that the price is, you know, nowhere near where it. Um, you know, as you just said a moment ago, you know, get, uh, levels that are nowhere near what you would call extended or stretched. So, you know, searching for value amongst the commodities, particularly during any pullbacks that occur over the next uh, two or three years in any particular sector of the commodities, because um, I mean, my own personal feelings, there may be a little bit of a pullback in 2023, 2024, around the time of the US election. It's not unusual to, to see that kind of thing happen. But um, beyond that and into the second half of the 2020s, um, yeah, I think uh, things could get really, you know, really crazy to the upside with a lot of these. Very hard to identify any one particular commodity sector. Um, I mean, you've, you've mentioned natural gas there. No doubt there'll be others, but I think that, you know, from mine and Patrick's point of view, we're going to be identifying those on a on an ongoing basis and finding value where 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 it's evident. But um, the, I think the broad commodity sector has a long, long way to go. And it, like any sector that goes up. There's outperformers that gen shift to underperformers and are replaced by. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, you know, yeah. you, you kind of like the button being handed from one to the other. It's mm -hmm. a bit like if you look at the cryptocurrencies at the moment, Bitcoin has been fairly stable for a while and you've had the some of the altcoins sort of surging and then Bitcoin makes a bit of a surge and then it's Ethereum. But when you step back and look at the big picture, you can identify the, the likely price target areas and they're all just kind of jostling mm -hmm. to reach their own personal individual targets. Um, and it's, it's the same kind of analogy, I think, if you can try and identify where you think those targets might be. And it's not, not always easy, particularly when you look at more than a sort of a year or two ahead. But, um, you know, there, there, there are techniques that you can use to identify these price targets and rough sort of times for these targets. And then on the way to that target, it's um, it's just a, a race where one's leading and then another, another takes over. So 
um, bars of soap all over the wet bars of soap all over the place. <laughs> I think <laughs> over the next few years. Um, Anything else you want to ask, Patrick, before we wrap this up? I don't want to take up too too much more of your time. Mark. It's been you know fantastic that you've uh, taken this time out of your day to speak to us. Yeah, no, I fully appreciate your time, uh, Mike. It's uh, it's always a great honor to, to have you on the show. I know you're very solicited, but uh, we appreciate your time there. And we, we keep always uh, hogging the whole hour there with you there. But uh, well, thank you, Patrick, we... Kevin. Yeah, have a good um, rest of your day. By the way, where are you, Kevin? I'm based in northeast England, a place called oh, Newcastle yeah. in north in northeast England, about 300 miles north of London. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we're just uh, trying to make the most of the last of our summer here in the UK. It's not been a great one as usual, but uh, anyway, oh, okay. we'll, <laughs> we'll make the most of it and look forward to a nice uh, a nice winter of uh, bars of soap, wet bars of soap flying all over the place. Right. And, uh, Thanks, and, and also in the in the stocks that are related, you know, if the guy, if your investors don't want to own commodities or futures, uh, that type of thing, look at the stocks that are the gold miners, the uh, you know agricultural related stocks, fertilizer companies. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff out there, you know. Yeah. So you can yeah. be long the stock market and be okay. You pick the right yeah. things. <laughs> Fantastic right, advice. Guys. Great, great advice and fantastic to, to, to talk to you and uh, to, to see your charts there, Michael. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, we'll speak to you again soon, no doubt. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, Thanks Cheers, guys. Man. Don't forget Bye -bye. to subscribe to, to Michael on uh, Twitter and his, uh, subscribe to his uh, newsletter, guys. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers.